50% of a thriving consumer finance operation. HSBC will own 50% of that thriving finance operation, as will other foreign banks with their partners. So you're still going to have, for many, many years to come, big dominant state-owned banks, but within them very vibrant growth areas, which will be 50% owned by the Chinese and 50% owned by foreigners, and that's the, the growth area. So you can put that down to uh, foreign finance, and you can put some of it down to local finance. It's a combination of both, but you're looking at little banks within these big banks, which are going to be the growth consumer lending area. Let's segue a little bit here, Russell. If, if consumer finance is driving consumptive habits in China and will over the next decade to two, and that causes more or less global or contributes to global inflation, what does that inflationary effect do to equities? Where does that leave the average stock or mutual fund investor? Okay. Well, I think the important phrase is global inflationary pressure, because obviously if you believe Milton Friedman, then it will be up to everybody to decide how much inflation they, they want to have, because inflation is everywhere and at all times a monetary phenomenon. So just because we have higher inflationary pressure from China doesn't mean necessarily we have very high levels of inflation or levels of inflation we, we associate with the, with the 70s, when a Keynesian approach amongst uh, Western investment, uh, central bankers was more prevalent. But I do believe that it means higher levels of inflation we've been used to, and it does mean that several attempts by the Federal Reserve to control inflation over the next decade or longer, which are not good for equities uh, and not good for bond markets either. Let me explain the, the, the rationale behind that. I've written a book called uh, Anatomy of the Bear, which looks at changes in U.S. equity valuations since 1881. Uh, and it tries to look at the turning points in those equity valuations and when they're high, what is the catalyst to bring them down to low levels and, and vice versa. And what you find is that great high valuations for equities have always been mean reverting to low valuations for equities, and the catalyst has always been inflation or deflation. I should stress that of the four great bear markets in the last 120 years, three of them were caused by rising inflation, and one was caused by an eruption of almost immediate deflation. Be aware that that was the 1929-32 episode. Mm -hmm. So I believe that inflation is the key catalyst to bring down equity valuations. They are expensive. I know everybody believes that they're quite cheap. If you look at current earnings, or if you look at prospective earnings, perhaps they look reasonably cheap. But I think the best way to look at U.S. equity valuations is to use a thing called the cyclically adjusted PE, which is what Robert Schiller uses in his uh, Irrational Exuberance book. It's a 10-year rolling average earnings number. It's what Benjamin Graham recommends in security analysis to look at the underlying corporate profitability. Uh, if you look at that, American equities are pretty much as expensive as they were in the late 1920s, 1968, 1901. Now, they're a lot cheaper than they were in 2000. The market has gone down a bit. Earnings are up a bit, up quite a lot. But they're trading at about 23 times cyclically adjusted PA. And at the bottom of a bear market after inflation has wreaked havoc or forced central bankers to run too tight a monetary policy, then we should expect them to get to 10 times cyclically adjusted PA or below. So this is why I believe inflation is so negative for equities, where it's, it's the catalyst for a mean reverting valuation event for equities. And the duration, I'm sure most people will be interested in as well. If this was an average duration for a swing from peak valuation to low valuation, it would last around 14 years. And given that valuations peaked in 2000, you'd be looking at a bear market uh, for valuations, which wouldn't end until 2014. So whether that's just a complete collapse in the price of American equities, which is actually the most unlikely event, or a lower price for American equities, plus earnings coming through to bring the valuation down, either way, it's not going to produce good returns. And investors have to hope that it's more via price stability for equities and earnings, corporate earnings coming through. But it could obviously be the other way around, and we could see a significant fall in U.S. equity prices up until 2014. So not a straight line decline until 2014, a cyclical pattern, and in many ways a repeat of what we saw from 1968 to 1982, a market which trades from about 600 to 1,000. Over that long period of time, earnings come through, boosted earnings come through, and over that long period of time, valuations come down very significantly. And with the adjustment for inflation, that's what you're talking about with the cyclically adjusted price-to-earnings ratio. The Dow itself could actually rise while its cyclically adjusted price-earnings ratio is still very unfavorable. Is that correct? That, absolutely, absolutely correct. The foreword to my book is written by a gentleman called Mark Faber, who I'm sure many of your listeners will know. And that's the point he makes in the forward, that actually the Dow Jones index could go up. But 
that the, the valuations would come down because earnings would come through. It is very likely in that scenario, however, that we'd have really high levels of inflation. You know, if American corporations are really going to have that strong profit, strong profit growth, it's probably that by a rising selling prices. So the purchasing power of your equity market, even if it's the same value as it is today in 2014, the purchasing power of it will be down very significantly. So we could see a situation of rapid declining valuations with no fall in price, but that is only likely in a very high inflation scenario. And I still think that's unlikely. I still think the central bankers will, will fight inflation. It's just that the fight against inflation, for those who remember it from the 70s, can be kind of painful for anybody who owns equities. Certainly, globalization changes the financial landscape landscape and it has over the last 5, 10, 15 years. If you look at any of the, the financial crises we've had in, in the last two decades, it happens one place and the ramifications and repercussions are felt all it, basically everywhere to, to one degree or another. We're seeing that with the subprime crisis now for very specific reasons. Why is there, I should say, is there opportunities in foreign equities or emerging market equities in a context where U.S. companies are, are suffering, or is the whole world tied at the hip? Our pain is their pain. That's the big, uh, that's the $64,000 question, isn't it? I, I believe that they're not tied at the hip. I believe in that buzz phrase we have in the markets at the minute called decoupling. I think there's actually evidence of it already, particularly if you look at Asian export figures. I mean, the great contagion for Asia was supposed to come via its export numbers. Now, export numbers are holding up remarkably well. They may not be holding up particularly well to America, but uh, Japan is doing well selling things into the rest of Asia. Everybody's doing well selling things into the Middle East. We are now, I suppose, coming up to 11 months of the subprime crisis, but the contagion is not being felt in Asia as yet. You look at a place like Hong Kong, it's a small place, but you've got 20% retail sales growth, 20% credit growth. You know, I think if we'd all been sitting here last year and knowing what was going to happen to the U.S. in terms of the scale of its credit crunch, I think we'd already be expecting some fairly significant fallout in other parts of the world. And there is some evidence that's not coming to pass already. But that is the, the crucial question. I, I'd flip it around slightly the other way and, and, and put it this way. There are many companies, sectors, and industries all across the world that will benefit from inflation, and many, many of them could be listed in the United States itself. I think you get a very strongly bifurcated market. Uh, look at all the sectors in America that have done well for the past two decades, and those are very likely to be beneficiaries of disinflation. And of course, right at the top of that list, one has to have the financial companies. And then look at the companies which haven't done well. And, of course, manufacturing companies would be on that list. I'm sure you're well aware of the renaissance in some sectors of American manufacturing. Well, that could be moved to significantly higher levels. Also, inflation is fairly good for companies with very high fixed costs.